Welcome to the Good Faith Podcast. I'm your host, Curtis Chang. And the Good Faith Podcast is a production of Redeeming Babel, and it's where friends who follow Jesus help each other make sense of the world. And if you live in the world for any amount of time, one of the things that you will definitely have to make sense of is cancer. According to the American Cancer Society, 40% of Americans will contract an invasive form of cancer at some point in their life. So there's a good chance to make sense of your place in the world. You're going to have to be making sense of your own cancer experience, at least 40% chance. And at those odds, it is inevitable. It is a certainty that you will be uh, talking to someone very close to you about making sense of their cancer journey. And so one of the ways we, crucial ways as human beings that we make sense of anything in our lives in this world is by talking, language. Talking is a crucial way that human beings have been designed by God to make sense of the world and their experiences in the world. And so how you make sense of the world for everyone is going to include how you talk about cancer. And this is the topic for today, how do we talk about cancer like human beings? And I especially have been thinking about this topic because I've been talking to a very special human being about cancer, and that is Nancy French. For those of you who know, um, Nancy French has been a longtime friend of mine, a collaborator in these recent years, a dear, dear friend. And recently she was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. And just as friends, we've been talking about that. And so we thought after some, some conversation that it would be good for us to share some of that conversation with all of you listeners. So Nancy, welcome to the Good Faith Podcast. Thank you, Curtis. And I do not want to be here talking about I this. also wish, to, do not want <laughs> you to be here, at least with this particular topic. I wish this wasn't the topic and we were talking about one of our other topics. But right. you and I have been talking offline about your cancer experience. And can you share a little bit about, about that? Because one of the, we had sort of like a meta conversation, which is whether should we even talk about this publicly? Should we even share our private conversations about your cancer journey more publicly? And then you finally decided, you know, I, I want to share that publicly. Can you give people a window into why you decided to, to do this? Well, Curtis, you're being very kind to not call our conversations rants. <laughs> um, but I have been, you know, like, I guess I haven't thought much about cancer. Like everyone, I have been touched by cancer. Both of my parents have it, but you don't think a lot about it from a personal perspective until you have it. So like I was diagnosed maybe four months ago and I'm new to the conversation to the uh, social norms surrounding cancer. So I'm having to sort of play catch up and all of a sudden realize, okay, like, what are the things that you say? What are the things that you don't say? However, um, you can sort of tell, like when people talk to you that they also haven't thought about it because you frequently have things like this. Um, yeah, I have this uh, triple negative breast cancer that's very aggressive. Oh, yeah, my Aunt Dottie had that. <laughs> oh yeah. How is Aunt Dottie? Oh, she's dead. <laughs> she died oh. from she died from the cancer, of course. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, like you would not believe how many people do that, which is fine. Like I think it's better. Like I really hate like speech police and I hate it that people don't feel comfortable like talking to you about difficult things. I would much rather people talk to me about difficult things and say the wrong thing than to self-police out of a conversation. But it has been pretty harrowing, the things that people have said to me. Um, and I'm sure I've said it to other people with cancer as well. So like, this is not just a, like me telling people all the things they've done wrong. I'm sure I've done the same things. Well, let's talk about some of those harrowing experiences in a moment. But before that, Again, give people a, a window into what, why you're wanting to talk about it now so publicly in this podcast, because we really went back and forth whether this was a good idea or not. So give people a window into why you think it's actually helpful to model uh, how we can talk about cancer. Well, you know, I think just the ubiquity of it demands that yeah. we sort of develop a, a process. But even if you don't know anyone with cancer and have never had it yourself, you know people who've struggled. And yeah. so the conversation today, Curtis, I don't think it's specifically cancer oriented. It's more like 
uh, sort of developing a theology of suffering or understanding how yeah. to deal with people who are in a bad place because you're either in a bad place or you're going to be in a bad place or you're just emerging from a bad place. And so, so sort of trying to determine how to deal with people when they're struggling is like a, a life hack, you know, like we yeah. need to, we need to know how to do it. Well, let's, let's break down. You said it's been kind of a harrowing experience to, to, have to talk with people who may or may not be prepared or haven't really thought very much about how you talk about cancer or other forms of suffering. Give us some examples of the types of conversations you've engaged in that have felt like, um, is there a better way than this? Okay. So one of the things that I've noticed is that when I talk to people and they find out I have cancer, yeah. I no longer become a person. I mm. become a reflection of their own fears. Ah. And so I'm not actually dealing with another human being. I'm dealing with someone who is projecting onto me their fears about their own mortality. Hmm. And so it's hard to have an authentic conversation with a person when they're jet, when they don't see you, they just, they're just skittish about their own death, impending deaths. I mean, I think there's something about the ine inevitable, inevitability of death that we don't want to acknowledge. Um, yeah. but it's weird. Like Curtis, if we met at a cocktail party, I'd say, Oh, you worked, Oh, you worked with InterVarsity. Oh, my husband's worked with InterVarsity. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe you guys know each other. Um, so you normally in conversations, you try to find points of commonality. Right. And so the one thing that we have in common with every single person we meet is that they're going to kick the bucket someday. And so are we. And right. so, it's it's off-putting because you never have that conversation at the cocktail party. I totally understand. It's off-putting. Nobody wants to have that conversation. But um, Curtis, you and I were talking about the concept of memento mori. Yeah. And when I got my diagnosis, I was in Chicago with my son, Austin, and he immediately said, let's go get a memento mori tattoo. <laughs> so good faith listeners, I want y'all to be the first to know that our whole family, including David French, has said that he's going to get a memento mori tattoo. Oh, it hasn't happened yet. No, because I can't because of needles because of chemo. So I can't do ah, anything right. fun. Okay. So um, I apparently um, the needle is, is a problem during this six right. months. So, uh, but the memento mori tattoo uh, is it taps into this ancient sort of idea. Memento mori is Latin for uh, remember that you must die. Um, and the idea, I think it started with stoicism, but I'm not sure, um, is that you have to be cognizant of your own death in order to fully live out your mm. days. And I feel this so strongly, Curtis. I feel so much more alive right now than I've ever felt in my life. Mm. I feel brimming with creativity. Weirdly, I have feel brimming with energy. I know this won't last forever because I know chemo is really hard. I'm halfway through. Um, but for people, and if you look at like art of like kings, you'll notice that there might be an hourglass or a skull or dying flowers, wilting flowers. In fact, if you look at Van Gogh's flowers, all of his flowers were wilting. Um, mm. But it's the idea where artists used to put these into paintings where it otherwise doesn't seem to fit. But the idea of death fits everywhere because it's something that we need to be aware of. It's something that we need to talk about, I think, a little bit less weirdly and something that we need to sort of settle in our own spirits. And so that's one of the things that I notice is that when I tell people I have cancer, I am no longer dealing with that person. I'm dealing with their projections about death and their fears. And it sort of truncates the conversation and it makes it weird. Okay. You're saying a lot of very profound things there. Let's, let's break this apart a bit. Uh, I really love how you describe how the act of of talking, the act of a conversation involves two people trying to establish some point of commonality. Like you said, we worked at the same place. We had the same experience. Oh, me too. But when you bring up that you have cancer, that brings an immediate shutdown for us, for some people, maybe for many people about that basic human desire to connect because now connecting with you means connecting with the commonality of death. And that is a scary thing. That is a, something that many people want to avoid. Mm. Um, and you are now a living memento mori uh, for them to remind them that you too are mortal. Uh, you too will die someday, if not of cancer, if you're not in the 40% or, you know, not the 40% is not everybody who dies from cancer. It's just who you contract. But I think the, the 
mortality rate is something like 20%. Anyways, the point being, Nancy French, you are a living memento mori even before you, you get the tattoo. So help people under, understand a little bit more this avoidance mechanism. Like, okay, you bring up the topic. What are the avoidance moves that people then make to try to avoid confronting this commonality that they actually share but don't want to actually acknowledge? What's, what's well, the conversational moves? I, this is easy because I did this with you the other day. I, I'm the guilty party, so I'll confess. Do you know what I'm going to say? I have no, no idea what you're going to say. Um, so Jody, um, Curtis's wife, Jody, was having some test runs, and I, and I said, I'm sure it'll be fine. Mm. And Curtis Chang, your beloved host, said, Nancy, you don't know that. And he and you were right. And here I am. I'm literally in the middle of chemo and I'm complaining, right, right, all these people or whatever, toxic positivity and all this. But that's what I was doing to you because I wanted the phone call was ending. We talked for an hour yeah. and I wanted to be assuring, reassuring to you. And you said, I you said, Nancy, that's not true. You can't know that we can hope that the test come out well, but we, we can't know it. And they did come out well. And I'm very thankful yeah. for that. But in that conversation, I have the same proclivity. So this is not mm. me saying, oh, look at all these people who don't know how to deal with cancer. Yeah. I've had cancer for like five minutes. And so these are just my, my half-baked thoughts. So that's interesting. That move that we say, I'm sure it will be okay. I think we can probably all of us remember times when we've said that. What's going on there, Nancy? What's happening for the person saying that? the person saying, I'm sure it's going to be okay. What's going on inside them? And then how is that hitting the person who actually does have cancer or, or has the possibility of, of cancer? Well, it's interesting. Um, I, 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 I don't know the alternative. I mean, I, the alternative is not to say something that's inaccurate. You don't have to go all the way to accuracy and say, Curtis, um, let me know whether or not Jody's going to die. Just let me know. <laughs> Tell me on Tuesday when the results yeah. come out. You know, like you don't want that, yeah. obviously. So forgive me for not having like, uh, you know, a, a full, like, I think just the way to to correctly do this is to connect accurately. Yeah. Um, because what, because I, people know me as a fighter, you know, yeah. a lot of the good faith listeners, you've heard me on here before talking about um, issues like, um, advocacy for other people, like, for example, with the Canicut camp situation where I was fighting for justice for all of the sexual abuse victims. I do that completely true. So people call me a fighter. They find me very pugilistic and um, they find me to be the type of person. They say this, well, you're the type of person that we need, or you're the type of person who fights, or you're the type of person who the world needs because you're fighting for justice or whatever. And my thought in my head, I always think, well, if Tim Keller can die of cancer, why not? <laughs> like the world does not need me compared to Tim Keller. You know, like yeah. I'm just, I'm just like a person. I'm not necessarily, in fact, I'm not a fighter. I only fight on behalf of other people. And as I, I was talking to Russell Moore and uh, his wife, Maria, and I was saying, I just don't have that much fight left. I've been fighting for years. I've been fighting the po politically. I've been fighting that camp. And I'm just, after all of those years of fighting, I just sort of feel depleted. And yeah. so when people are like, oh, well, you're a fighter. I think I am, I, I'm not really a fighter. And if I were a fighter, I might not be in this moment. Um, so it makes me feel like they don't know me. Um, mm. But I feel like people are just trying to put a positive spin on it. Just like I was trying to put a positive spin on y'all's test. Um, it's, but it's not necessary. I think if you could sort of, you don't have to have a positive spin. If you can be comfortable in the discomfort yeah. um, with the person, because I guarantee you that the person that's got cancer is not comfortable in any, yeah. you know, in any way. So like, if you can just sort of enter into that discomfort without trying to drag them out of it. Okay, so that's really insightful, Nancy, because what that makes me think of is when I say, which I've been guilty of as well, of saying that sort of um, kind of, uh, what's the right word? Yeah, that, that move of I'm sure it's going to be okay or it's going to be okay. I, I do this with my daughter. I do this with my daughter. When she's, she has a chronic health condition and I can find myself slipping into the, similarly that, oh, it's going to be okay. Um, I think as I reflect on that, 
what's really going on for me is I'm actually talking to myself. I'm telling myself it's going to be okay, Curtis, because I'm feeling discomfort at the thought of my daughter suffering. And so I'm actually, this is your point, I'm projecting my own discomfort off this issue. I'm not actually talking to my daughter. I'm talking to myself and I'm re trying to reassure myself it's okay, it's going to be okay. And I think what you're saying there is actually when I make that move and I'm actually turning this conversation into a self-assuaging, self-comforting interaction, I've, 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 I've moved you out of the picture as an actual person. Uh, I'm not talking to you and the actual reality that you are in a uncomfortable period of uh, and, and a situation of uncertainty. And I'm just, I'm actually, it's a, it's a one person conversation. It's a monologue actually. And so you're not being seen. Your experience isn't being recognized. Is that an accurate picture of then how, how that feels on your side of a, you know, of somebody just saying, oh, you're, it's all going to be, all, it's going to be fine. You're a fighter uh, kind of conversation. Yeah. But also it's a little bit more than that. It's also, and in fact, Curtis, when I said that to you about Jody, it was at the end of the conversation. Yeah. It, we were wrapping things up. Do you know what I yeah. mean? And so yeah. at the end of that con and we talked honestly and candidly, and I'm sure I dropped some huge moments of wisdom on you. Uh, oh, totally. That I was, yeah. I was being pummeled by wisdom. Right. Uh, like you couldn't yeah. take any more actually. It was <laughs> yeah, kind exactly. of made it to end the conversation, but we were ending the conversation and there's something about just trying to move on. That's right. weird. Right. Then it's yeah. the same way with you. Like Curtis, you've gone through trials and you've sort of been irritated with me because I pick up the phone and it's Curtis and I'm like, Hey, how's it going? I know you're not fine, but it's just like the social. <laughs> yeah. Kurt, he's corrected me a few times, dear listeners. Um, yeah, here we are. We're still friends. Um, but it's like, well, irritating. no, wait a minute. You say, how's it going? And I, I get in a moment of just utter silence, because I, I don't know how to answer that I question. <laughs> no, you're completely right. You're totally right. I yeah. think the thing that I'm pointing out is that the social mores, uh, yeah. the social, the conversational lubrication, the words that yes. we say to make things happen sometimes are not great. So like, yeah. I could imagine like if my dad were sitting right here, he'd say, well, everything's going to be fine. I'm saying true things. What's your problem? You know, um, yeah. And, and he's right. So my cancer diagnosis was a little bit more dire than it is. It sort of got slightly better when we realized that the cancer that's in the lymph nodes have not, has not spread to other parts of the body to the degree that yeah. we can determine. So that's huge. But for like two weeks, I was like, uh, I mean, and I still am sort of reflecting on my own mortality, you know, so like you're yeah. like sort of just in the dump. So you're thinking about all of these big things. And uh, then you meet someone at Kroger. You know, yeah. they're just living their life. They're looking for the right asparagus and yeah. they're just trying to get out of the conversation. You know, like I totally am aware of the fact that yeah. not everyone wants to like go into the moment with me of, of disease right. and pestilence, which I appreciate you don't want anyway. Um, yeah. So there is something about just being socially not weird, you know, yeah. just being able to say, oh, it's going to be fine. Okay. But let's, but that that's fair, right? Like, you know, what's your, we're, we're looking for a conversational close, a stopper yeah. to the conversation, but it does feel like the, well, I'm sure everything's going to be fine or, um, you know, other kind of statements that actually are not true and make the, the person, the other person feel unseen and unacknowledged. That's, that's doesn't feel great. Let's just workshop this for a moment, Nancy. Like I'm talking with you. We've talked for an hour. I'm trying to wrap up the conversation. How do I close that? Or you're, we're in the supermarket, right? How do I close that conversation in a way that doesn't just make it sort of be a false social lubricant or worse, just kind of give me a false reassurance that everything's going to be okay for me? Uh, so, mm. Like what, what would that even sound like? How do I end a conversation with you, Nancy, that isn't sort of trite, cheap and self-serving? Well, I guess listeners can just wait to the end of this podcast and see what words you say. But um, <laughs> I, you know, I think there's just no magic words. It, this is going to be awkward. Everybody is struggling. Um, you know, I think if you could just say if you I think if you try not to say things that are inaccurate, that's probably the best. You could say anything. Yeah. The asparagus is on aisle 17 or <laughs> see you next Wednesday or I'm thinking of you or um you know, I, so many people are so kind. I've been so blessed because when I, I've talked to so many people and people because of the cancer diagnosis, 
<laughs> you know, yeah. when people start telling you that they love you at the end of conversations that you're not in a good space, but, um, I talk to people all the time who I just have, you know, like sort of less than I don't talk to them, you know, maybe like, like maybe once every three months or something. And when they start saying that, I, I love you at the end of conversations, you think, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm in a bad space, Yeah, <laughs> like, but it is sweet to know. And I've become more liberal in my, um, expression of affection towards my friends too. Mm. Well, actually that's a great close. That's always, that seems like that's a, a always going to work close is rather than making some statement about like reality uh, that is on, that is false. Like I'm sure it's going to be fine. Uh, just to say, I, I love you. I'm, I'm, I will be thinking about you. If, if, it, if it is, if it can be a true statement, something like I will be praying for you, uh, then, which by the way, is a statement I always am really careful to make. Cause I really want to make sure that is a true statement. Like, like I actually will be praying for you. <laughs> um, uh, so it seems like statements of affection, like I, you know, I, I, I love you. I, that, that seems like a helpful yeah. close or, or, or conversation. Um, this, I think another kind of grammatical check on oneself, uh, that I think I'm, I'm really trying to practice, um, is to shift from statements of prediction or, or statements of reality to questions, right? Shifting it to the question is, seems like in general, a better move. Of course, you have to be really careful about how probing and inquisitive you are, but just how are you feeling? What's next? Um, yeah. how can I be praying for you again? If that is something that you really will be, will be doing what, what are the questions you appreciate Nancy, uh, people asking you? I don't know. So y'all may not realize that I have a numbers issue. Um, Curtis knows it full well. Uh, but I really struggle with numbers and dates and directions. And so if someone asked me like, what time are you talking to Curtis today? I wouldn't know unless it, yeah. unless Curtis texts me and he's like, Hey, why aren't you on this call? <laughs> um, like I I've been fired from jobs. Like I've had major serious problems with it. So every time I talk to people, at least at the very beginning, I would, every conversation was, Oh, I'm so sorry. When did you find out? When does chemo start? How long does chemo last? Oh, so they're asking you logistical informational questions. <laughs> Where yeah. do you get your chemo? Um, and it's stuff like that. And so I yeah. never know when I'm getting my chemo, literally no idea. If you put a gun to my head, I'm going tomorrow. I could not tell yeah. you if it's at noon or four or 8am. Yeah. Um, and so I would just, I just started making stuff up because I was so depleted. And so everybody that I talked to at the time, I was having treatments at Vanderbilt at 10 o'clock. <laughs> I, I don't know because it didn't matter and so right. i knew that they didn't care about the answers so i was just like i don't know you know 10 cool springs thursday 17 i don't know um and and so ever and it's still that way like people want to know how long and i i just don't know so i sort of make stuff up but i think that it's very beautiful curtis because the, the people asking the question it's like you want to show that you care about me right so you call me and then we're on the phone. So you have to communicate with words, but there's no yeah. words. There's yeah. no magical words, even though you're a public theologian, there are no magical words. And so for me, I mean, I don't know. I'm not in the, like the cancer community. I'm not, I haven't talked to very many people with cancer, but um, I think for people who have cancer, just it, an understanding that people really are trying so hard and there's yeah. nothing that's going to help. There's no balm. Yep. There's no magic words. And so just having normal conversations, even if it's the same thing that you've said 20 million times, it's like being pregnant when everyone asks when the baby is due or being engaged and people asking yeah. when the wedding is. Those people in your small group that ask when the wedding is, they ask you every week because they don't really care what you say. It's just a way to show that they're thinking of you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I think that's right. I think that's right. And so one of the things that we have been talking about uh, is language. And in particular, one of the key things about language is metaphors, uh, a key part of language. Some people would linguists would say that even language itself is a metaphor. Uh, it is a it is a way to convey something about a reality uh, in terms that are akin, analogous, so forth. And metaphors are, are a profound aspect of language. And uh, Nancy, we've been talking about this. A uh, common reaction people have had, which is they will say things like, 
oh, you're a fighter, Nancy. Um, and it, it brings up a common metaphor that is used with illness and with cancer in particular, which is military metaphors, militaristic metaphors, uh, which comes up a lot. Susan Sontag, who actually had cancer herself, wrote a very interesting book back in the 70s called Illness as Metaphor. And she was responding to uh, a big public campaign that Richard Nixon uh, launched called The War on Cancer. And she was saying, basically, she was questioning the helpfulness of this war metaphor, this military metaphor to talk about cancer. And this is pervasive, right? This is the battling cancer. You see this in news articles and so forth. So-and-so battled bravely until the end. And then, and so Nancy, how, how have you been engaging with this dominant cultural metaphor for cancer, which is rooted in the military uh, metaphor? How, 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 does, how have you been dealing with that? Well, it's interesting. It makes me feel inadequate. And the Mm. reason why is because I am not, I do not feel like I'm in a battle. I feel like something is happening to me, like Mm. almost like a fog has descended upon my house. Um, I feel like if I were in a battle, I'd like gird, I'd like put on my armor and I'd charge out the door. I'd have my squad with me or something, but this, it just feels so different and lonely and isolating. Now, I think like frequently you see people like the, if you ever want to see what Curtis and I are talking about, if you Google like cancer products and cancer gift bags and stuff, they always have um, stuff like, you know, make cancer your B-I-T-C-H or F you, you know, F cancer or, um, you know, it's something like that. And it's, and it's weird because it makes you feel like if you can just garner up against or uh, up, if you can create enough energy and be determined, fierce enough. Yeah. Um, and I just don't feel fierce enough. I, I don't know. I like, I hope to survive this. I plan to, I hope to, but I don't, it's not going to be because I'm fierce. Um, and I, there's something about this that when I got my diagnosis, I was in Chicago with my son and I was waiting to hear back from my friend, Mike Hamilton, who was the former athletic director at the university of Tennessee. Um, he was getting a, a organ transplant and I had a feeling he probably died because we had not heard from his wife, um, for eight hours. So I wake up and I'm waiting to hear if whether or not Mike Hamilton, my dear friend had died. And he had, um, when the phone call came and I was told that I had cancer. So Mike dies of cancer. I don't know it. I'm worried about it. Then I, I get cancer. And, um, I went, so I've had to go to two cancer funerals since I've been diagnosed, which is uniquely horrible. Um, but I went to Mike's and the way, and it was a lovely funeral, but the way the articles, the newspaper articles talked about Mike's death were exactly, as you said, that he lost this battle with cancer and Mike Hamilton is not a loser. And all of the friends and family members that you guys have that have died of cancer, they're not losers. I wouldn't characterize them in that way. But when you characterize me as a fighter and a winner, um, you are inadvertently sort of mischaracterizing the people who have died of this terrible disease in a way that you might not realize. And so maybe because the moment of my diagnosis coincided with, coincided with Mike's demise uh, mm-hmm. made me feel more sus- uh, like sensitive to it. Yeah. But also, and this brings up another fallacy toward the, you know, my aunt Dottie had the same disease as yours and she died. Um, the other one is my aunt Linda had the same disease as you, as you and don't worry, she lived. And it, it just feels like two fallacies because like, Aunt Linda lived, but I can't talk to Aunt Dottie. So I don't hear from Aunt Dottie. So it just, it feels like there's no rest for the weary in terms of language. I yeah. And I think maybe God intended it that way, Curtis, because maybe we should sit and feel comfortable here in this world. We're in the now and not yet. Um, and in the anxiety opportunity that Curtis wrote, actually, he has this very beautiful chapter about not hijacking your um, yourself into an imaginary future. 
Um, and I had the benefit of reading that book and working with Curtis on the book before I got my diagnosis and Curtis, it actually helped. Um, because in this moment, like I'm talking to you and we're having a great conversation and, um, this is fun, you know? So like in this moment, everything is fine. It's not, if you project out to tomorrow at some point, <laughs> some unknown time when I'm going to be having chemo. Um, but like not being hijacked into the future is very helpful but yeah. part of that is just being comfortable in the moment, just saying, mm -hmm. okay, being comfortable in the discomfort, like this really is horrible. Um, yeah. but I'd like to sit with you in it, yeah. you know, like yeah. that's sweet. It feels like something of that military metaphor is actually, uh, like, like you said, it's not giving people a, a place to just be in this, in the moment with all of its dimensions. Uh, but it's immediately situating it to the outcome. You're trying to jump to the outcome um, and the outcome has to be positive. It's going to be positive. It's going to be a victory. Um, yeah. and, it, and it just doesn't seem like life is usually broken down into these kinds of binary win, loss, defeat, victory kinds of things. And cancer or any illness isn't experienced that way. It's not like, because what I think your point is exactly right. Um, what does that mean if you adopt that metaphor to the people who die, which by the way, is all of us, it's every single one of us. So it's putting all of us in the position of losers. If the, if the idea that to die from something like cancer is to, uh, to be a loser, right? It doesn't mean we don't have an experience loss. It of course is a loss. It's a loss of life, loss of all that we value in life. But there's a difference between, uh, having ex doing experienced loss and feeling like I am a loser of a battle that I should have won, right? Mm. I think that's kind of what you're getting at uh, because it, it ultimately then it means like we're all consigned to futility and defeat in that regard. Yeah, and also it, it like if you could just see my life, I'm not fighting anything. I'm going mm. to chemo. Now I should say that I have been reprimanded over my attitude, my cancer navigator told me that maybe my attitude was not exactly correct because I felt more resigned to death than she liked. She was like, you have to have, you have to have uh, courage and you have to, you know, like have a little bit of oomph about you. And, yeah. but I needed a little bit of time to adjust to possibly kicking the bucket before I could get, you know, sort of my attitude, right. I don't even know if my attitude is correctly, um, you know, calibrated at this moment, but I do feel very thankful. I trust God. Does that make sense? I really yeah. trust God. And um, I don't know if I will live through the day, you know, like you don't know what your future holds. And so you yeah. have to get to the point where even if it's the worst case scenario, you're okay with it. I feel yeah. like this is the case with my life. I think that's why memento mori is so important. It's such an important yeah. uh, concept is that you can do hard things. And life is not the end of it. Like, even if it's like you're making a very difficult decision to alter your family through adoption, like yeah. that, that was a very difficult thing. And I sat down with my kids who were like eight and six, I think. And I said, this is going to be really, really difficult. This could be, this could, this will change our lives forever, but yeah. life is short. So yeah. you do the right thing. And so it allows you to be more like courageous. Um, if yeah. you're not trying to hold on to, life at all cost. Uh, does that make sense? Like you're like, totally we've done sense. like when David joined the, the army and was deployed to Iraq again with the yeah. kids it, are probably going to need, you know, therapy for the rest of their lives. But I sat down with him and I was like, okay, he could die. You know, I wasn't going to lie to them and yeah. say that war is not difficult. I wanted them to understand that freedom actually is costly and and David may not come back. And, and he did his, his, uh, unit suffered more casualties than any other unit during that time of the surge. And so he yeah. suffered so much loss. Um, and yeah. so d dealing with that and not covering it over, but same thing with that deployment, uh, every time we met people, they would, they would come up to me and the kids and say, everything's going to be fine. It's going to be great, you know, yeah. and they would be crying, you know, and it's yeah. like, they were just dealing with their own their own fears but like i was already raising the kids to know that life is treacherous and it's temporary and it's not something yeah. to grasp with all your mind so i had to sort of like unteach them from the ch the well-meaning church members 
who were trying to comfort us. Well, I think it's it feels like you're drawing a distinction between trusting in God and presuming an out that God will deliver a particular outcome, namely a favorable outcome to you. Those are two very different things. One is actually truly trusting God that he will hold us even in our death. And the other is demanding, presuming that God is going to deliver a particular outcome, namely that you will not suffer, uh, suffer loss. And the latter is often is a mischaracterization of faith, right? That, that to have faith is to believe that God, of course, will not have your husband die or have you die. And I think that the, and I write about this in the book, uh, and, and it's because it's something that is really important because if our answer to anxiety uh, is that we have to have faith that we will not experience loss, uh, that is a very treacherous, that actually is a treacherous place for us to be in because any of us who have lived knows that that does not always happen, that God does not always, God has never promised he would, and God does not, in fact, always save us from grievous losses in our life. And so if we expect, if we believe faith is believing God will always save us from loss, then what happens when that doesn't happen? Then our mm. actual faith in God gets shaken very deeply. And I have seen this happen to some close friends where, uh, you know, I had a friend who had cancer, a very, um, you know, dire, uh, diagnosis and he was part of a very charismatic community and in that charismatic community they articulated that of course god would definitely save this person and if they just needed to have faith and they uh just surrounded him constantly with this god's going to deliver you god's going to deliver you uh right up until the end until like the very end when the doctors were saying, no, this, you, you, you know, you are terminal. You're going to die in the next few weeks. The, the, this charismatic community around them kept insisting that, that God would deliver him in a miraculous way. And it didn't happen. It didn't mm. happen. He died. And as a result of him trying to adhere to this sort of vision of, of, um, of deliverance, he actually, uh, did not get a chance to say goodbye to mm. a lot of people in his life. Because to do that would have been, in that view, an expression of lack of faith. And I just felt mm. so, felt like it was so tragic, right? But it's a extreme version of what I think afflicts a large portion of Christianity, which we, we have mixed up true faith in God with actually expecting a particular outcome from God. And mm. um, I think that leads to ultimately a very fragile faith that almost is set up for some crisis of faith because God doesn't, does not actually play by our expectations in that way. Um, so anyways, that's my long rant here. No, um, that's right. And you also had, didn't you have a, a back issue in college that your charismatic yeah. friends tried to pray away and it yeah. didn't? Yeah, I write about that in the book also, and probably because again, that was a that ended up being a crisis of faith for me. Um, it and and seeing that God didn't heal me from my back pain, actually deepened my picture of God and my a sense of relation with God of God not as some cosmic vending machine in the sky, which if we just pray the right prayer, push the right spiritual buttons, then of course God will deliver this outcome we desire. That that that's a mechanistic picture of God not a personal picture of God. And so on that front, Nancy, I want to ask you in this experience uh, of suffering, you know, if you're willing to tell people like, what has this done for you spiritually? How has this affected your picture of God, your relationship with God or, or, or anything else you want to share? Like what is, because if it's not then a battle to fight, but rather an experience we go through, what is the spiritual nature of that experience? Well, it's interesting. I was not with David when I got my diagnosis. Um, I was in Chicago with my son. In fact, the nurse called and she said, are you by yourself? And I, there was nothing in me that was going to wake up my son from my solid sleep, my 23 year old son and say, get on the phone for this diagnosis. I was not going to do that to him. So I was like, yeah, I'm alone. I, she was like, okay, call David. So I, I added David to the call, which was, uh, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning, I'm sure I was, I said, I did a three-way call. I said, I have cancer. You're I'm connecting you to the nurse. That's how he found out. Wow. Um, 
yeah, but I didn't know what else to do. But um, my son, Austin, is so amazing. He's a, a philosophy major. He is university. an amazing young man who has, uh, we've had the privilege of spending time with when he was out here in Santa Cruz, at the University of Santa Cruz. Yeah, you guys have raised an amazing young man. So. Wonderful guy. And Curtis and Jody have like sort of adopted him while he was out on the West Coast. And it was so sweet. And Austin loves them. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> he thinks that uh, Curtis and Jody are the best people on the planet, which is oh, unfortunate no. since on. he's met us. No, he did, he did say that. But um, anyway. So I was with Austin. So I was with a philosophy major, if that gives you any indication where this is going. And so we're sitting in this apartment in Chicago with floor to ceiling, you know, windows looking out at the glittery city and the beautiful Chicago Tribune building. And, you know, it was just like such this weird like moment. And Austin said, I think I'll remember this for the rest of my life, mm. uh, this mm. moment. And he said something that was so pretty. I, I literally have cried on every good faith podcast. I think Curtis, have I? I think so. I think you're out. You've got a streak. You don't need to keep that streak going, but just no, yes, kind of, you, you're. I, I'm you're just on a warning burner. listeners. <laughs> but um, he said, "There's beauty in this," which I thought mm. was so interesting because I was like, "Huh, there is beauty in this." Now, this does not mean that you know the next time you see a, a, somebody who has cancer, you know that's what you lead with because it's harrowing and it relates to hair loss and constipation and blood and infusions that are nasty. And I think, you know, that's 99.9% .9 of it, but being with my philosophy uh, major son was so interesting because we talked about just the beauty of um, not being in control of things and huh. your whole life being upended by something that's real. Like this is really happening to me. And so it really puts everything in perspective um, in such a beautiful way, like I cannot ghost write another book, you know? So like, I'm a, what do I say at cocktail parties when they ask me, Oh, what do you do for a living? I don't do anything. I don't write books. I don't investigate. I'm not an investigative journalist. I just sort of, I'm trying not to die, you know? And there's something yeah. that's so beautiful about that. There's that focus. In addition, additionally, there's something very beautiful about, uh, like I know I'm saying things that might seem like toxically positive, uh, but this is just what I've noticed from my own experience is that I find that there's so much beauty in it and that people connect with you in a way. Like, I feel like we always connect with each other's like projections of ourselves. So like Curtis, I might want you to think that I'm super smart because you and Jody are super smart or you and Jody and Dave, whoever we're hanging out with, everybody's smart. So I might use polysyllabic words um, or I might, I don't know, I might project a part of myself so that you think that I'm smart. Um, but when cancer comes in, it's like, I, this is it. I, I literally am bald. I have not, I have nothing. There, I have no uh, like pride. I don't care if you think I'm smart, you know, um, yeah. like it's just, it's just not a thing. It doesn't matter if you've got money is, is, it's re uh, regardless of your so social status or your uh, financial status or whether or not you own your own home or whether or not you have kids or whether or not you're married or whether or not you work, people get cancer. <laughs> and yeah. it's so beautiful to connect with another human being, regardless of all of these other things, regardless of yeah. politics, like, uh, there was a beautiful moment that I had in the chemo place with this woman who I later realized was very conservative. Um, and it didn't matter because we, we met each other at the moment of need when she was in need, yeah. she was diagnosed. And, um, so like we embraced in that moment and we didn't, I didn't ask her who she voted for, or who she was going to vote for. Yeah. Um, and there's just something very beautiful about that. It, honestly, it is so clarifying to s all of the things that are, um, it feels like a, a sermon on Ecclesiastes or something. Like mm. you just live that, like nothing matters. This is all vanity, you know, and like 90% of your conversations are so inane. Um, but, but with this, you can have real conversations with people. I've had the most wonderful conversations, people who are terminal, man, you'd want to get it into a really interesting conversation. I'd love to talk to people and to hear their thoughts about their diagnosis. That's, that's terminal, you know, and yeah. it drives their family members crazy that they call it that, but they label it that and it's true. And so 
they want to experience it in its trueness, but their family members won't let them or whatever. I just love yeah. hearing people's really, really story, really interesting and true and candid stories that are not affected or poisoned by pretense. Yeah. Um, but in my whole life, I've always felt that way. That's one of the reasons why I think I went into ghostwriting is because I could sit down with my clients and say, okay, so tell me about your faith. Did you get baptized? What do you think about death? Has, have you ever seen anyone die? What was that like? You know, and also to find out who they kissed and when. Um, but <laughs> I've always really wanted to know, you know, just to skip all the the casual conversation and get to the meat of it. And so this sort of allows it. Nancy, one of the, when we have been talking about this, you have been describing uh, this picture that it's this beautiful thing, yet horrible thing this harrowing thing and yet incredibly liberating uh, that in terms of getting to the heart of the matters, like it's this very rich, complex picture. And I don't know for a listener, if you are like me, but I get the picture of somebody who is describing this land that is just dramatic, beautiful, storm tossed, yet beautiful sunlight. And like, it's just this very vivid picture, but it also feels a, a bit foreign, like even, even though I've had like life threatening, you know, I, I've had a, turns out to be a false cancer diagnosis, but for, for months, I, I thought I had cancer. And, um, so I, I, I have, I remember when you're describing all this, I like, Oh yeah, I remember that it was like that kind of vivid, like you're in a storm one moment and then you're in a beautiful vista of a countryside on another, like it's this, this, you're alive in a different way. But what's striking to me is that how much I've lost that the, when I've returned back to quote unquote normalcy, uh, when I return to not a situation where I may be confronted with my death. And I wonder if some of the listeners also have this sense of if you're listening attentively, you're like, boy, what Nancy describes sounds something very vivid uh, and alive, alive, actually really alive. And yet it also feels foreign and distant if you're not in it. Um, so Nancy, like talk to people about, and this is, I'm putting an extra burden on you because this, you should not have to be burdened with this. You're going through your experience. You're not like having to like make this helpful or relevant to people who aren't going through this experience, but I'm going to ask you anyways, um, like help people, like if you're not going, having a cancer diagnosis, but you hear somebody like you talk and you're like, there's something there that feels like I want to experience but I, I'd like to experience it without having to go through a cancer diagnosis. Like how can they incline more into this kind of aliveness that you're describing without, if, if without having to, or without, if, just because they're not in a life or, you know, life threatening um, situation. How does one do that? Honestly, I don't know. Um, yeah. I feel like there is something that can be done, some sort of strategy, for example, um, following, um, Russell Moore told me that he follows this hospice care person on Instagram mm -hmm. where they give you all these tips about people dying, which I think is macabre and also fascinating and awesome that he does that. Um, but also like, um, people die all the time. Like I was getting yeah. one of my chemo drips when my mom almost died. And so I got this call like, Oh, go to the hospital down the street. Cause your mom say your final fare farewell to your mother. And I couldn't go because I was literally connected to the machine. So she is still kicking. Um, and uh, but she's in her terminal decline, probably. And, um, you know, not I, I, there's something about parents dying um, mm. where you can enter into that more, even if you don't have a great relationship with your parents. Don't miss that. Like, yeah. don't be so skittish about death that you can't talk to people when their kids die. Um, yeah. Also, my whole life, um, when I meet someone who's a widow or a widower, I always ask, tell me about your wife. Tell me about your husband. How long has he been dead? How has that affected your life? Like, I always just want to ask because I feel like there are sort of two deaths. There's the death of the person that actually, you know, uh, winds them up in the ground. And then there's the death conversationally because people pretend like no one existed. Mm. Um, and so there's something about just being sort of more able to enter in to the deathly spaces that are all around yeah. us, but man, they are all around us. And Curtis, this is important. Death is everywhere. And 
it made me think of the anxiety opportunity in the following way. And I'm not even just saying this to promote the book, but everybody should buy it. <laughs> you're, you're doing an amazing job, by the way, of doing that. So well, thank you. Your, your book is about loss. Yeah, that's right. And so it's yeah. like a serious, like it's actually applicable. And I'm so thankful that I worked on that book um, because um, Curtis talks about loss in a way that is just beautiful. Um, but the the reason I bring it up in the context of this is we have to get comfortable with loss. We have to get comfortable yeah. with grief. And the reason why you find it weird to talk to me when I have cancer is because you haven't done the work. You're apprehensive to grieve. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. when you talk to people who are not afraid, I, I'm not saying that you should be not afraid of death. I mean, maybe that's probably a spiritual principle that the public theologian on the other side of the country can correct me on. So I don't know how you're supposed to like approach death, but I do know that death has been defeated or yeah. it will be. And so yeah, that's, that's one right. of the reasons why I hate Amen. these pugilistic sort of metaphors about cancer because, oh, are you fighting cancer? Did you, or, he lost his, he didn't, Mike Hamilton did not lose his battle against cancer. Yeah. Um, he won it. Jesus won it. And so Mike's going right. to enter into that victory. And oh, it, so appreciate it feels, Nancy. yeah, no, it just feels so like, I don't know. It feels so, it feels like such a reduction to say that people lose their battles with cancer when in actuality, that's not, that's not even, it's not even real. It feels right. real, but it's not, it's not spiritually real and spiritually real is more important than physically real at this point, I think. Um, but the, the reason I bring up Curtis's book is because he talks about loss. And so in the book, you talk about how you're going to lose your beauty. You're going to lose your hair as I have and the beauty. Uh, you're going to lose your kids. Your kids are going to die. Yeah, you're going right. to die. Yeah. The meal you make tonight is probably going to stink. You might burn it. Maybe not. <laughs> But all of these things, it's, it's like the degradation of life, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And so, Curtis, the way that you talk about that is you've got to be, you've got to get used, you have to have a, a, a way to view loss. Yeah. And the way that I view loss is different now as a Christian than it would have been when I wasn't a Christian. Um, and... Um, it is helpful to me now in this process because now I'm facing the ultimate loss, which yeah. is my very life, but I'm not scurrying around trying to save it. I am not suicidal. I want to live and I trust God and I'm doing all of the things, cancer navigator who gets up in my business. I'm doing all the things I, I'm supposed to do, all the things that you're telling me to do. But I'm also, I just trust that God has my future in his hands and that yeah. it will be awesome, maybe, um, or it might just be cut short. And so whatever's on the other side of that is okay with me. Um, yeah, and one thing about the Momento Mori Curtis that it, it reminded me of this Psalm 90 verse um it was mm. it says that our days may come to 70 years or 80 if the strength endures and the best of them are but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away but then in verse 12 it says teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom and i mm. feel like that's sort of what we're talking about is that you you know here we are uh, with this biblical admonition to ask God to teach us how to number our days so that we yeah. might gain a heart of wisdom. I don't know how to do that. Like I, I'm not spiritually um, wise, interested, <laughs> curious enough to have figured this out without my cancer diagnosis. So once I got that, it felt like uh, my life had been transformed and I could see things like I could see almost like in Plato's allegory of the caves where you cave where you see all the shadows, but there's yeah. something that's real on the other side of it. I feel like I, I suddenly I could see the shadows for the shadows that they were. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. longing to see the real. And I just, it's just very beautiful because it just makes everything very clear. It makes your life's purpose very clear. And uh, it makes conversations more interesting. If you can get past some of the frivolity and the, you know, the, the the problems the discomfort that people have yeah nancy that's beautiful i love your description of how that actually 
we have so many death, um, death shaped spaces in our life that we can enter into either people with terminal diagnosis or people who have already suffered death and loss. Uh, I love this idea about not having talking to people about the people they have lost to death and not inflicting the second death of memory uh, where they get, they're obliterated from our lives. Um, you're giving us so many gems of how actually you do not have to go through a life-threatening diagnosis yourself to lean into death um, shaped spaces to still draw from the lessons, the wisdom, the beauty that's present in these spaces. Um, I love the idea of, of leaning into that. I, I think of my own experience. I, that was what I was trying to do when for years I volunteered myself as a hospice volunteer uh, just oh, to right. actually lean into that, to expose myself to, to that because there was such beauty and wisdom as well as sadness and pain. Um, and we can all do that. You don't have to be a hospice volunteer. There's plenty of people in your lives already who, again, have their lives already have been touched to death. Uh, and the invitation that you seem to be describing is let's lean into that. Let's not shy away from that conversationally, relationally, but lean into that. It's a beautiful gift. And Nancy, you've modeled that for us this past hour by talking about death so openly um, and talking about cancer so openly and talking about the and all of what that's what's involved. So thank you for that gift. Closing question, Nancy, what do you want listeners who many of them are fans of you, love you, admire you. What do you want them to know about what you're going through either next or currently? Like how can they in some way from a distance still feel connected to your journey? Okay. Well, um, first of all, I just want everyone to know that I love them so much. I um, sort of became a public, I let my diagnosis be known in a public way. And everyone has been so kind. The people that have reached out, um, all of you guys are amazing. I mean, I know that some people may give Twitter slash X slash threads slash Facebook slash LinkedIn. No one gives LinkedIn a bad rap because no one's on it. No one cool. Uh, anyway, um, social media gets a bad rap because it is so it has it could be a cesspool of evil, but I have seen it be used for so much good. I love all of you, all of the messages, all of the direct messages, all of the gifs, all of the cats hanging from a limb of a tree. Love all of it. I love all the pictures of your dog. So keep them coming. Know that I feel your support and I love you so much. I can't even tell you. So just keep the prayers coming or the positive thoughts if you're not a prayer and just know that I feel it. Thank you, Nancy, so much for talking with me and talking with our listeners about how we talk about cancer. Wait, so, Curtis, I didn't cry. You didn't. You made it. You made it through <laughs> through a whole episode. That's hey, what awesome. Is, I know. Are you going to tell me that you love me though at the end? Because uh, I just I do wondering. love you, but that's not a ploy to try to get you to keep the okay. streak of crying. On good <laughs> I just want listeners to see it happen in real life that Curtis Jane no, no, does no. love me. I, it has been recorded for perpetuity right here. That is an easy thing for me to say, Nancy. And I think it's Aww. something that a lot of our listeners say. And listeners, thank you for listening to this conversation. And uh, once again, next week, we will be gathering around the campfire. <laughs>